Oh, jingle! Happy time has just begun. Brother, sister, smart, dumb, fun. Yeah! Sunday. It's brunch time. We're early. We're the Brother Sisters. Early. On a Sunday. It's brunch time. Drink a coffee. Get my t-shirt. With a skeleton. And some Halloween stuff. <laughs> so actually, I can do I that should, for an hour. <laughs> I, I should have some Halloween stuff out. And I don't. I'm mad at myself because I was going to, but I did. Yeah, um, Anne. It's Spooktoberfest. Where's your Spooktoberfest finery for okay. crying out loud? I'll be right back. I have one right here. Okay, so I'm going to have to hold the fort while Ann puts on her Spooktoberfest. So we'll make commentary about Ann's house right now. Uh, you can see her cat in the background. Oh, there she's good. She's got the Spooktoberfest cat. That's cool. Where'd you get that? CVS. Okay. Uh-huh. I went in there. Why to is get it my... that? Dr- what? Yeah. Why, why is it the drugstores have the funnest stuff, if that's a word? I know. I know. Dude, you, you go, know. I'm like, that's the best reason to go into a Walgreens is to go to the Isle of Seasonal Crap because it's yeah. always so fun. Look yeah, at exactly. that. I know. It was, nice. like, it was like, it was awesome. I was there to like get a, some sort of, um, uh, I think I was there to get my, uh, a booster of something. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm getting a shot. I deserve spooky skeleton kitty. And I was going to have it dancing and stuff. But last night we went to a wedding and it was super fun. The reception was super fun. And I danced. I didn't even drink. I, but we danced and danced and danced. And man, we got home at like 1130, which for Duncan and I is like 3.30 a.m. Thursday morning. So Man, I am rough this morning. I'm rough, and I didn't even drink. I got I'm like my feet hurt, my hips hurt, my thigh, everything hurt, and I couldn't think very well. I keep like walking around. I'm like, I didn't even drink. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You're asleep to breath. <laughs> uh, oh. Well, don't worry, Anne, uh, because um, we we we'll just take it slow today. We'll take it slow yeah. when we talk about. It. We won't go too fast. I won't talk too loud, even though you didn't drink. Uh, <laughs> you want to know the truth? I was a little bit rough yesterday from us going out to and have drinks on, you know what it was? It was that shot that Hannah, the bartender bought me uh-huh. that put me over and put me over. It was like having that third old fashioned, which is you, which is the thing you never do. So right. yesterday I was feeling a little bit rough. So I finally, I finally worked it. Out. I went and mowed the neighbor's lawn yesterday and that helped me kind of work it out. Cause I got a little bit warm, sweated it out a little bit and that seemed to do the trick. So yeah, no, that was so funny. I was telling Duncan, I said, you know, Duncan, Jenny and I were at the bar, you know, and we're sitting there eating our, our salads and having our, our thigh wings and drinking a drink. And this woman buys Jenny a shot. I was like, hello, am I invisible? I'm like, why are you buying my sister slash wife a shot, bitch? What? <laughs> I was like, Damn. It's because I... Okay, so uh, Beer Exchange is one of my go-to places, and it's kind of my happy place because, A, the food is so good there, and, mm-hmm. B, they make a really great drink called the Toronto, which is a, a whiskey-based drink, which I like. And, you know, I go there probably once every couple of weeks, you know, when I'm feeling, you know, because I've been by myself, essentially, for the last six months. So um, while my husband is away doing other things. And so it's, sometimes it's just nice. I'll go there on like a Thursday evening or something because Thursday is bar night and Hannah is often the bartender there. And in, in our conversations, she is becoming a teacher. So we've had lots of teacher talk stuff. So we, you know, and so she was there on Friday night. She was, it looked like she was having her end of shift dinner or something like that. And at one point I just kind of gave her a nod. She gave me a nod. And then, you know, about 15 minutes later, you know, Austin, the bartender brings over a shot. And she's like, Hey, this is Hannah wants to buy you a shot of makers. And I was like, cool. So I ended up putting it in my last my second old-fashioned and that was and then i was like yeah i I probably won't drink the rest of this old-fashioned and then i did (laughs) it was an eventful night at because then so like we're watching we're sitting there at the bar and then i was going to talk about the angry guy that i gave uh Mm -hmm. obvious side eye to that who walked away after i gave him obvious side eye because he was being a complete dick so anyway yeah uh Yeah. so yeah it's been an action-packed week uh, for both of us, obviously, we mm-hmm. haven't even gotten to talk about the fact that we're going to talk about book stuff today. So. Exactly. But no, this Super is my excited. favorite. This is my favorite uh, Halloween T-shirt that I have. It's a big moon with a. It's orange and it's got a skeleton of a dinosaur on it. So obviously, I'm also and because we're talking about books today, I'm wearing my mm-hmm. National Writer Series hat. So I am. I am ready. I have a cup of coffee instead of booze today mm-hmm. because it's sure. a brunch time talk. So exactly. you know, there you go. Exactly. So. And, 
Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so shall we get, do you want me to do the synopsis today since you are sure, uh, you feeling the a little synopsis, rough? Since I'm a okay. little rough. I, I love You're a little rough. I picked all black kitties this week. I love black kitties. <laughs> right on, right on. Uh, so Joe, Joe Vieta, I just want you to know, we heard your feedback about our PowerPoints and don't mm -hmm. worry, changes are coming. But for the time being, that was good feedback, by the way. And yeah. uh, so I, I talked to, I'm just going to give you a quick history. I'm going to put our shining faces back on. Uh, I talked to my cousin, Joe Vieta, who lives out in Colorado, who uh, is one of our regular listeners, as it would turn out, hey, and Joe. who I value, whose, whose opinion I value very mm -hmm. much. Yes. Uh, made some great points about uh, our format and what he wants to see from us. And I think it's awesome because we are, we are here for our fans and we are here for our listeners and viewers, and we want to make it bigger, better. And so we relish your feedback. Um, to to make this, you know, we've evolved quite a bit since our beginnings back in 2020, and we want to continue to evolve and, and make this fun and entertaining for our listeners slash viewers. So that's what we're all about. So, so Joe, just so you know, we heard your feedback. We're going to stick with the format. We're coming up on our 50th episode. So we're uh, we're planning on doing some changes, uh, mm -hmm. not huge changes, just some format changes when we get to our 50th episode. So, you know, just want you to know, heard, chef, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Sorry, I've got a black kitty, like, scratching me to pet him. So I was like, I might be going, ow, ow, because he loves you with his nails. <laughs> That's cat love. Cats love you with by hurting you. It's amazing. And by hurting so, you, exactly. Yes. So, all right, fun fact, we are the brother sisters. I am Janice Brothers. With me is my sister and brothers. It's not a fake. We is our last name is not AI generated. It is our last name. We mm -hmm. are the brother sisters. Huzzah. Uh, all right. So we are in our fifties, uh, which means we are generation X, which is coincidental that we are generation X, but it's not coincidental in the fact that that is what has shaped who we are and how we do our business. It also means that we basically uh, grew up <clears throat> being educated by schoolhouse rock. And it's how we <laughs> learned the rules of grammar. Uh, it was a hairy people. bear. It was a scary, was a scary bear. bear. Mm -hmm. I made a hasty retreat from his lair and I pulled out my adjectives. My adjectives. <laughs> bloop, bloop, bloop. Yeah. That's how I learned what a noun was person, place, or thing, you know, so. Verbs, conjunctions. I had no idea what a conjunction was until conjunction, conjunction junction. Conjunction. What's your function? Your Hooking function. up words and phrases and clauses. <laughs> yeah, I know. I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, interjection, which is my favorite one because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the reason I say rats all the time is my <laughs> way of, of, of disgust. Or I'm like, rats. That's because of interjection. So there you go. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So now you know. And not only that, but Schoolhouse Rock also uh, taught me about the law, you know, bills. And oh, yeah. That. Bills. Uh, so as you can see, uh, as what we do, we talk about smart stuff, dumb stuff, fun stuff, or any combination of the three. Uh, we are because we are in our 50s, we also could be accused of not being cool, hip, or sexy. Um, and, you know, we know this because we will ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, pestily mm -hmm. so. Like, if I'm at a training, I'm the one that's raising my hand. I'm like, well, what about this? What about this? There's something I don't understand here. I'm not afraid of sounding dumb because I, if I don't ask, I won't know. And then I will be the dummy in the room. Mm -hmm. So we ask questions and it's the same way. I am the exact same way. If no, because one, I don't want to uh, find out that I'm doing it wrong later. And two, I want to find out how dumb the person that's teaching me is so that I can make fun of them later when, while they, um, when, when they don't know. <laughs> so uh, we basically just summed up who we are as people and just uh, gave you her reason for uh, asking questions. And I gave you mine. There you go. There okay. you go. <laughs> I use mine as ammunition. I ask questions uh, to gather ammunition against you. <laughs> would you, would, uh, so Anne, do you think, would you go so far as to say that you use your powers for evil and I tend to use mine more for good? I, I wouldn't say I use mine for evil. I use mine for advantage. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> well, um, it's funny because I'll, I'll bring this back to you. Um, I uh, I have dyslexia, and I learned uh, um, I learned 
how to get as much information as possible to want A, to learn and to B, to hide that I was dyslexic. And so I often looked for um, whatever I could find on anybody because it would be either I could use it uh, to help me learn or I could use it to help distract from the fact that I wasn't learning. So that's Smart. why um, So that's why I always asked questions because uh, I was looking I was looking for all the ways, not just like an answer, but all the ways to try to figure out to navigate my environment. <laughs> so that's what oh. I used it as an advantage. I used it. I was, I was using it to give myself an advantage. So that's, that's why. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see what else. Uh, we are great to, our podcast is great to listen to when you want to learn things about stuff and because we are guilt-free to listen to, you know, we're guilt-free. We'll make you feel good. We're not going to make you feel bad like a murder podcast. Um, right now, I was talking to my friend Tara last night, who is obsessed with the Menendez Brothers podcast that's going on right now. Oh. Because uh, they're a thing. The Menendez Brothers are back in a big way. So that's the big podcast that's happening. We're not like that. We're, I'm not going to talk about the Menendez Brothers, even though I did start watching the series on Netflix and it is uh, cheesily addictive. Ugh. Oof. <laughs> it's poorly produced. Um, and uh, so watchable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't that interested in the case. I remember when it was going on uh, in the first edition, like right, when they were actually right. being tried. And I wasn't that interested before. I was like, you know, so I didn't pay attention then. So I honestly, I have no idea other than that they were accused of killing their parents and convicted of killing their parents. So, well, they actually admitted to it and what oh. it ended up the, the trial. And this is one of the things that I had forgotten is that they did admit to it. Um, and they pleaded self-defense because of the abuse of their parents, which, um, is the thing that, you know, there's a lot of people that are revisiting the case that maybe mm -hmm. they shouldn't have been convicted. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, I wasn't there. I just know I was so easy. I was so distracted at the time by the OJ trial that I kind of mm -hmm. missed the Menendez, you know, because it was, you know, it was in California. You're like, right. I, know, I can only take one sensational trial at a time. Thanks exactly. very much. Yeah. So uh, one more thing about our podcast that you should know, this is not a PG-13, PG or G podcast. We will drop F-bombs, A-bombs, S-bombs, combinations of those bombs. Mm -hmm. So if you've got little ones at home, earmuff them because we're probably going to say things like, fuck. There, I just did. I got it out of the way. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, please join us um, on Spotify, Amazon, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. You can catch us there. We would love it if you would follow us, like the podcast, tell mm -hmm. friends, neighbors, family, and all that sort of good stuff to please like the podcast as well, because uh, that's how we're going to get listeners. That's how we're going to make our stuff better. That's how we're going to get you free swag. All that stuff is true. So um, we would love it if you followed us and did all that. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you can find us on all the big streaming services, Spotify, Amazon Music. Alexa knows our name. She knows that we're a thing. So, mm -hmm. you know. Exactly. Um, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, one of the things that we always do is we always take a little time to talk about things that are dumb, fun, or smart that we encountered this week. Of course, we've spent the first 15 minutes of our show today talking about a bunch of smart, dumb, fun stuff. Let's continue. And uh, tell us about your smart, dumb, fun thing. Oh, well, I did a smart thing this week. Uh, Duncan and I went and saw the uh, play Thirst by Franklin Doyle at Williamston Theater. And it's a dark comedy, and it starts out a dark comedy, and it just ends dark, 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 dark. But it was very good, very thought-provoking. Um, you know, it takes place in the near future when the Great Lakes have been um, uh um, damaged basically beyond repair by an oil spill. And then yeah. how this company, uh, creates a pill that you take in order to keep you from dehydrating and dying. And only the most wealthy people can drink water. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah. So it's, yeah, um, sounds, it's, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, but saying that it's a dark comedy is, um, there's some an understatement, an understatement. Yeah. But it was very, it's very thought provoking. Our friend, Tony Caselli directed it. We talked with Tony bef uh, a couple months ago. So if you want to uh, listen to Tony Caselli talking about the Williamston theater, 
uh, small professional regional theater in Michigan. It's a great interview to go back and listen to. That's so that's in our archives. But we went back and we watched. Uh, we went and saw this play, and it was totally worth it. And it's still going on. If you would like to see this play, it's uh, uh, only uh, it's less than ninety minutes. It's uh, no intermission, so it you, you know you're not sitting there all night or anything. It's it's very it's very thought provoking and well performed. So you, you it you don't even realize by the time you're you're done with it, you're like, oh man, it's done already. So it's it's a really, really good show, Thirst by Franklin Doyle, Williamston Theater, something smart to do. Love it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just going to take a second to plug these small regional theaters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people, their experience with theater is if they're only going to see some sort of big production on Broadway or a mm -hmm. travel or, you know, touring company show. Um this is a which can be somewhat inaccessible, especially when it comes to cost. So if you're mm -hmm. looking for really good live theater, and I think live theater is such an excellent experience. This is affordable. It's reasonable. It's it's professional theater. So these people mm -hmm. are at the top of their game. Um, I can't, you know, so Williamson Theater is a great, um, great example of a really wonderful local, small, regional theater. Check it out. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Indeed. Huh. Nice. Um, all right. So for me, I went with something dumb and uh, I went with uh, Bo and Yang as Mu Dang on Saturday Night Live because I can't <laughs> stop watching it. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with uh, Mu Dang, Mu Dang is the baby uh, pygmy hippo from Thailand at the Thailand Zoo. And uh, the Internet has basically been obsessed with this little juggernaut hippo. Mm -hmm. And last week, Saturday Night Live did their had their debut episode. Maybe it was the week before, and mm -hmm. uh, Bo and Yang, who was one of my favorite regulars on Saturday Night Live, um, was dressed up as and, and basically, you know, interpreting uh, Mu Dang for us, and it was it was it was epic. So oh, so funny. <laughs> Who's water? Ah! <laughs> so 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 funny. Now I realized that you know Saturday Night Live. You know, it's it's so funny to listen to people give feedback about Saturday Night Live and how it hasn't been funny in fifty years and blah blah blah. And I I think anybody that thinks that is just it lacks. I, I don't know. There's a there's a lot of really great funny stuff. Um, it's just that these you know the humor gets younger as we get older, and as a result of that, I actually think Saturday Night Live is much funnier than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I watch the old clips of Saturday Night Live, and I'm like, I don't think it's that funny, but. Mm -hmm. You know, time and place, you know, and so right. I, I really feel like it's it's it still stays relevant uh, because they keep evolving with the times. Mm -hmm. It's very much a, a show about the times that we live in. So I mm -hmm. think Saturday Night Live is still great. It's still funny. Um, I think I think the cast is, is fantastic. They're in their 50th year this year, which is, you know, <laughs> amazing. And I just think it's um, yeah, it's still great. And I would highly recommend um, it's great. They have a, a really great channel now on YouTube. So if you miss it, you know, because 1130 again, like, Ann, it's like, what? 1130 what? at night. Give me a break. That <laughs> What's that? I, I was like, as uh, soon as it so, got dark, I'm like, I'm going to bed. Yeah, bedtime. <laughs> so you can always catch Saturday Night Live on YouTube because there's a lot of funny stuff. Mm -hmm. So good job. All right, Ann Brothers. Yes. Uh, we have fooled around long enough. Mm -hmm. So Let's talk about our top five scary books to help you really appreciate the Halloween season. Now, Ann, I just want you to know right now that I went through and I changed the formatting for all of our slides. I saw so, that. Um, well, and that's that's because regional manager Joe Peters said we should be doing that, that when we have any sort of top five, top ten, top list, we should be doing a reveal on our slides. And I was like, dude, regional manager said so. Okay. When Joe Peters, regional manager, talks. We listen. See, look, see all these feedback, all these Joes in our life that are giving us positive and helpful feedback. So, uh, so Anne, would you like to go first? I would love to because I, I, um, I love, I love horror movies and scary books, and I, um, I dedicate the end of September through October into the first week in November uh, to scary literature. So. Okay. Let's talk about it. So All right. um, I, I have a huge list of books, but my number five top scariest five books for me right now is The Stand by Stephen King. And this is one of his very earliest books. Uh, it was published in 1978. And I read it when I was in my 20s. So I read it when I in the 1990s, early 1990s. And it was the first time I read a book where I'm sitting there reading a book and I was actually at a rehearsal for a play and I was like getting ready to get, uh, so I was reading, my cue was coming up. I put the book down. I stood up to, um, 
to get, you know, into character for my cue. And I heard somebody cough and I was like, it, it brought me right back to the book because the book is about a, um, a, uh, a, a disease, a virus that's uh, been, um, altered for war purposes that has escaped its lab. And the first thing it starts is with people coughing. And so I heard somebody cough and it just brought me right back. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, it, it made it real for me. And that was the first time a horror book had ever done that for me. And I've read it a couple times. Um, uh, some of the some of the writing of it is a little dated, but the story is timeless. So <clears throat> if you're interested, and it's a big, thick, juicy, by the pound book, you know, they sell this book by the pound. So if you haven't read Stephen King's The Stand, get the full version, not the edited version, get the big version. And um, boy, you're, unabridged. it will, yeah, yeah unabridged. It'll mess you up. Yeah, yeah, it will mess you up. It will mess you up. So anyway, so, and that, that has stayed with me. I mean, I read this book when I was like literally 30 years ago and it's still in my top five. <clears throat> Nice. Uh, the next one, uh, this is a new one for me, Head Full of Ghosts. I read this last year. Uh, and um, actually, I, I listened to it on Audible. And as soon as I was done, I listened to it again. That's how good it was. I was. I, I am usually not interested in stories about um, possession. I think they're boring. I think they're usually uh, pulled out too long. Um, but this one caught me. I heard a review about it on NPR. And the reason why I read it is because... This book is about a young woman, a 14, uh, no, she's in high school. So she's about 15, 14, 15 years old, who is supposedly possessed and her parents don't have the money to get her the care she needs. And so it becomes a reality TV show. Oh, what? Yeah, this, and that's what, that's what hooked me. And I was like, it, it talks, it's, 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 you know, mental illness, how we don't fund uh, healthcare, um, how it, uh, our our obsession with uh, watching uh, televised train wrecks, just <clears throat> it, it's a hard book. I will tell you this: it's a hard book, and uh, but it is fascinating, and you um, it'll it, it stays with you. So this is a new one for me: "Head Full of Ghosts" by Paul Tremblay. Excellent book. Uh, I would probably have not have ever chosen it if I hadn't heard a review about it on NPR. So very good NPR, book. They, uh, that's usually my go-to place. If I want to find a book, mm -hmm. I will usually go to National Public Radio, their website, and mm -hmm. find out what they're, what they're saying because they have never let me down. Uh, this is another one I heard about from the same article last year, The Rovers by Richard Lang. And this is uh, a vampire story it's set in the 1970s. And uh, it's... If I was uh, going to, if I was ever a literature professor, I would teach this book alongside um, Of Mice and Men because it's about two men uh, who are brothers who are traveling together and they are both vampires and how they navigate the world uh, as basically um, uh, displaced um, people. And there are other vampires in the book who live the same life. You can't, because of the way they live, they can't stay any place for very long because then they'll be found, they'll be figured out. So they, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, talks about, uh, being unhoused. It talks about survival. It's, it's, uh, it's very, it's the, um, undocumented only they do it in the form of vampires. And it's a really, it's a really good book. And I would literally do these two stories together of mice and men and the rovers, because they are very close in the story that they're telling about being on the fringe. So fringe excellent book. Of life. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Excellent. Excellent story. Love it. So that's my number three. So both of these are fairly recent. Uh, my number four or my number two is World War Z, an oral history of uh, the zombie war by Max Brooks. And um, I love anything written as an oral history. I just really enjoy that. In fact, my last two books are kind of written as oral history. So World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war by Max Brooks. And the in interesting thing about this is that this takes place 10 years after the zombie war. So it's more about humanity than it is about zombies. But uh, this book, uh, 
this book make, makes me cry. Like almost after every oral history, I almost want to cry after every single one because it's so, there's so much humanity. These books, these stories are so human. And uh, Max Brooks wrote all of these stories with the zombie as the villain, but he's actually writing about things that actually happened during wars. And instead of making it um, and, and just to, uh, making the, the villain, the zombie, all of this tragedy, all of these mm. events have happened mm. in the past. Um, he's just bringing them, reminding us of them, and he's using zombies to do it. So if you want a really good, book, a good writer, yeah, if you yeah. want a really good book about humanity and this and how we survive in good and in bad, this is an excellent example of it. So this is a great, a great, uh, and this came out in 2006. So um, <clears throat> we're coming up on 20 years on this one. Yeah, that's great crazy. Story. And it's, this is one of my favorite books ever. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it, it didn't make my, my scary book top five, but this is probably one of my top three books that I've ever read. I love it mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I just rave about this book. And like you said, that's the part that gets you is the humanity portion of it. it to me, it's not a scary book in the sense that the zombies aren't scary. Everything else in it is scary. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> exactly, nice. exactly. And then my number one is the Testaments by Margaret Atwood. And Duncan was asking me, my husband, Duncan was asking me about my top five. And when I said that the Testaments was my uh, number one, he's like, you know, most people wouldn't consider that a horror book. And I'm like, and I said, if you have a uterus, it's a horror story. So um, uh, I come back to this book two or three times a year. And uh, um, I read The Handmaiden's Tale when it first came out. I've read The Handmaiden's Tale a number of times. That that made it onto my, um, my you know, honorable mention list. It did not make it into my top five. Again, what I really enjoy about this book is that it gives me a broader picture of the world. Uh, the Handmaiden's Tale is told from the perspective of one woman. Uh, this is told from the perspective of three different women who are affected by the, in this community. And, um, Oof, man, man, oh man, is this, uh, oh, the story is, is fantastic. It's terrifying. Uh, you don't know, actually, as it ends, you really, you're hopeful that it will have a happy ending or a positive ending, but you're not positive because, yeah. you know, it's the world. And even because when we're every, terrible at remembering terrible things, <laughs> well, not only are we terrible at remembering it, even when we have all the information, we still might not make the best decision. Truth. So, um, and it's about, you know, this is about, this is about a world controlled by men brought down by women. So, yep. uh, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, you will come, it will stay in your head always. You'll come back to it. You'll wonder where, if you were in this place where you fit. And that's the thing about both, um, the Testament world war Z and the stand is that you're reading it, wondering where you would fit if you were in this story. And I think right. that's a very powerful thing. And you would do the, you do the same thing for these. So, <clears throat> mm -hmm. so that's my yeah. five. Okay. Uh, excellent. Five. Uh, we're, we, we, we do cross paths <laughs> on a couple of these books and brothers. Okay. So there we go. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So, uh, my top five scary books, uh, and I was a little bit all over the place in my book. So I'm going to start with, uh, with this one right here. Um, I did some nonfiction on this cause I, 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 I truly believe that, um, uh, that what happens in the world is, is scarier than the stuff that we even write about. I, I picked Midnight in Chernobyl by uh, Alan Higginbotham. Uh, this book was released in 2019. Uh, Higginbotham is a, he's a journalist. He worked for the uh, Sunday Telegraph for years as the U.S. correspondent. And now he basically is a freelance dude. And uh, this book is about, it, it, it talks about the history and the, the, uh, the disaster of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986 and the, the HBO limited series uh, Chernobyl was based on this book. And what's interesting about this book is that, and I think the part that's super scary is that you have this, this massive superpower in Russia that is faking it until they making it. You know, that's the best way I can describe the Russians and how they do everything. And this is a great example of that. They had, this technology, they knew it wasn't the greatest. They built this place. They knew they weren't doing a particularly good job and they were cutting corners at every turn. This was literally going to happen. And the people that were building this were like, yeah, this is probably going to happen. And this is, to me, what's what's tough about this is that Russia didn't learn any lessons from this. And you, know, you have this country that is controlled by a madman 
and he has all of this terrible technology and all of this um, at his disposal. This disaster could have been so much worse than it was, and it was a disaster, and mm -hmm. it could have been literally a world changer had had what they thought was going to happen happened in terms of the you know you know the meltdown that was happening through the the concrete barriers. This could have been much worse, and it's super terrifying. And the fact that uh, it will probably happen again. Well, it has. You know, it happened at Fukushima, but it will probably mm -hmm. happen again in Russia. And like I said before, you have this country that is, um, and we've seen it over and over again. We saw it with their space program. We see it in their nuclear program, and we're seeing it in their war machine. So it's mm -hmm. not it's not great. Midnight Chernobyl, super terrifying. And I'm going to talk more about Russia in a minute when I talk about my number one book. So anyway, that's my number five. Number four, I went with The Shining by Stephen King. And I think this is just one of the best ghost stories there is. Mm -hmm. It's such a great ghost story book. And literally one of those uh, books that made me feel chilly as I was reading it, that scene mm -hmm. where they're doing uh, the animal maze, the, that mm -hmm. the animal thing is fucking terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I get so mad when I look at the Stanley, Stanley Kubrick film because I hate that movie. I fucking hate it. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate it not because um, it's uh, – oh, wait. Um, Alexa's reminding me of something. Oh, hey, Alexa. Stop. Sorry, I had a <laughs> reminder. It's, my whole life is Alexa reminders. But anyway, this book was so good, and the story was so good, and it was so genuinely scary. And I don't like what Stanley Kubrick did with the book or with the movie. I just, uh -huh. he totally, it's a, com if I had never read the book, I probably would have liked the movie more. Uh -huh. Because the movie's genuinely scary. It's a good scare fest. But I get so mad because I feel like he took a story that was amazingly scary. And so much dread in that story and that gets lost in the movie mm -hmm. because he totally changes the tone it, it's very much all about uh you know jack nicholson's interpretation of this character and becomes to me about nothing else mm -hmm. which is a shame because it's such a great story and you know, we really focus in on the boy and we you know his father yes is a big part of the story but he's not that main part of the story so i like this book a lot it scared the poop out of me mm -hmm. and again I know when I get scared because I get chilly, like that one scene in um, The Conjuring in the basement with the mask uh -huh. blows out, ice cold. I went ice cold, <laughs> ice cold. And I got that when I was reading this book. I'm like, I am ice cold. This scared me so much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. As only Stephen King can do, he is genuinely the master of horror. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Uh, all right. My number three book. I, I I cheated. I comboed. <laughs> Uh, and I comboed with The Handmaid's Tale and Testaments by Margaret Atwood for different reasons. Um, a, I think uh, I married these stories together, even though she wrote them years apart. You know, she mm -hmm. wrote, she Decades. released uh, Handmaid's Tale in 85, and then Testaments mm -hmm. was what, 2016? 2019. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And what's interesting is that, for me, was that when I read first read Handmaid's Tale, I was in college, which was super scary for me because the main, the protagonist in that book is a young woman about mm -hmm. my age when I read that. Uh, and I reread it again in the spring because I had forgotten some things and I was glad I reread it. And then I read Testaments right after that, just this year. And I, what I loved about Testaments is that as a 50 year old woman, you know, one of the, one of the main characters in Testaments is a, you know, a 50 something, 60 something woman. And it really makes you think about your, your place, like you exactly. said before, your, mm -hmm. your place. And it was just, it was super timely to read Testaments because I don't know where I would be. I think I would, yeah, I would like to think that I'm smart enough or maybe could survive by being an aunt, but I honestly think I would just be one of the women in the stadium maybe getting shot or, I don't know, maybe I would have been one of the women in the stadium doing the shooting. Mm -hmm. So that's the part that is, like you said, you, you put yourself in these places. And I, and I think as a woman, and I don't want to make this about, you know, you know the, the differences between males and females, but as a woman – um, and I had this conversation with my husband the other day. It's, it's, it's hard to make men understand what it's like to be a woman in a world that is dominated and controlled by men. And the narrative is written by men and has been for years. And though we're trying to change that, it's amazing how fast that can go bad mm -hmm. and how badly you need men as advocates. And that's one of the things that she talks about in the Handmaid's Tale is that when the you know the main character's bank account gets frozen and she no longer has access to her job or her money, and her husband is like, "Oh, you know, it's it's going to be fine. It's going to turn around." 
and that the, she didn't have an advocate from her most closest, most loved, you know, person that she trusted in, until it was too late. And I think that's what is super scary is that, you know, we live in this world right now where we are very much under threat. And like, if you listen to the rhetoric, rhetoric of, of certain politicians right now, it's terrifying to be a woman and to hear that rhetoric that if you're not having babies, you don't have value. Or if you're not, um, if, you know, you're trying to make choices for your body, you, you have no value. And that's, that's not great. And so Margaret Atwood is a master of, she's like a master of seeing the future. And I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about these uh, books. I'm also talking about, you know, the books like Oryx and Craig and her Riverland mm -hmm. series that. Her man, Adam. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, um, because it's the same thing, except instead of talking about, you know, women, she's talking about, you know, corporations and their, their global mm -hmm. influence, which we are living right now. So anyway, this, these were, it, it was hard for me not to put these at number one, because I, I feel so, so strongly about these two books, but there's one that's even scarier at the top of my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the stand, because the stand was like, and this book just struck me is it's never gone away. I was at a grocery store when I was like, I don't know, I was 21 maybe. Mm -hmm. And I had a handful of stuff and I'm standing there at the checkout line with my arm full of stuff. Cause I just came in for one thing and I ended up with like 10 things. And then I'm like, at the checkout counter is the paperback version of the unabridged version of the stand. And I'm waiting. It's a long line. So I grab in the book and I read the first page and the first page was so gripping. I just mm -hmm. added it to what I was buying. I'm like, I must have this book <laughs> right now because I'm like, I must start reading this immediately because uh -huh. it was so gripping. You're just like that, that first scene in the book, you're like, Holy shit, what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. And I didn't put that book down for, 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 you know, the days that it took me. Cause like I said, it's a thick book. It took me a couple of yeah. weeks to read through it, but you know, that's when I was doing my summers at Consumers Energy. And so mm -hmm. every break and every lunch and every, I did not speak. And, the, you know, the guys that worked there made fun of me something awful because I had my face in that book. I'm like, shut up, you guys, you're, you're bothering me. I'm like, shut up, <laughs> shut up. You'll be, you'll be the 90% that's dead. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was in a movie theater when somebody coughed mm -hmm. and I was like, and it does, it, it just that it was shocking how that moment you're just like, <gasps> Is that a cough or is this it? You know, where you're yeah. like, your brain immediately. I'm like, how does he do that? And Stephen yeah. King is so good at getting in your head. He, for for his gift is not just that he writes things that are super scary. His gift is that he knows what your brain is doing. He uh -huh. gets into those super deep, dark three o'clock in the morning places of your brain and puts those on paper in ways that are so descriptive and so engaging. It's hard to mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that somebody can write that well. Yeah. And. Yeah. So no, but yeah, that's, that's one of these books that I, I think about it all the time. Again, the more I've listened and read this book, the more I realize I do not want to survive any of it. I would just mm -hmm. like to just drop dead during the pandemic. Cause I don't think I'm built to live in a world, um, in the, in the post-apocalyptic world. So there you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. All right. So my number one book, is uh is this is a nonfiction book it's deadliest enemy our war against killer germs and it's by michael t osterholm uh who is an epidemiologist and he is also hang on i gotta look at my notes here because there's a bunch of stuff he's the as far as i'm concerned that dude is the man so uh, he's an expert on germs uh where is he there he is all right so michael t osterholm uh, he is a regents professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, and he is also the director for the Center of Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this book is just jam-packed with um, stuff that's super interesting and also really scary for many reasons. Uh, number one, this book is such a great history of uh, epidemiology itself. And epidemiology, if, if you're not familiar with epidem what epidemiology is, it's essentially, um, it's an epidemiologist studies uh, and analyzes diseases, their distribution, their patterns, um, determines what causes them, um, what conditions are around that's causing them, how they affect a population, and then also what you should do to stop them from happening. So uh, Michael T. Osterholm is an expert at these things. Like I said, he is, his resume is, is thick. And this book is, uh, I believe it's a must read because he talks about not just the history of, of pandemics themselves, but um, what epidemiologists do in order to figure out what's happening. And he goes through a chapter where he takes you through three very specific scenarios of what you know was done 
Um, but then he goes on to talk about um, public policy towards uh, epidemics and pandemics. And that's the part that's really scary. And COVID was a great example. He actually does a really excellent forward in his newer version about COVID. And he talks about that, how if you don't have policy against, you have nothing. And we saw that in 2020 because, and the, the scary part is that governments know that pandemics are one of the greatest threats to a population, more so than warfare, it's pandemic, it's viruses, it's, you know, and countries know this, but they will refuse to spend money or plan for this. And so you're literally behind before these epidemics even start. It's also the, the scary, super scary chapter is how much military dollars are going towards biological warfare. And guess who's at the forefront of that? The Russia. Russians! <laughs> yes. And the Russians are just like throwing shit at the wall to see what will stick. And everybody's like, China, China, China. I'm like, oh, no, don't worry about China. I'm sure China's doing this, too, as we are. But Russia has been very out front with their policies towards um, biological warfare. And again, we don't have uh, any sort of response that's ready for this. And it's this is the thing, you know, if you look at, you know, people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, this and that. You don't really kill the Romans. Disease. Viruses. <laughs> Pandemic. <laughs> Pandemic malaria. is what malaria. Yeah, it was, and you know, so the the great societies um, are not brought down necessarily by they're you know they're brought down by natural disaster, and most of those natural disasters are related to pandemic. So, you know, that's the thing that scares me is that a and now we live in this time where we won't vax anymore because vaccinations are too scary. And yet vaccination is the reason that our lifespan, you know, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, uh, the average lifespan for an American was 49 years. And a hundred years later, we had nearly doubled that lifespan. And it was because of scientific discovery. It was because of electricity and it was because of vaccination. And we don't, now we see vaccination as a threat instead of this thing that has elevated our quality of life, elevated uh, how long we've been able to live. It's saved the lives of millions of, especially kids, you know, when you mm -hmm. look at the polio, you know, epidemic, and we treat it like it's this with disdain. And that just about kills me. And like, we live in this time of this terrifying time of scientific denialism of stuff that's really straightforward, like the earth is round. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We went to the yeah. moon. The earth is we round. We went to the moon. The earth this is round. Keep from getting us um, smallpox, you know? We don't control hurricanes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> it literally makes my, my head want to explode. And that's why this book is my number one scariest book, because A, it... It should scare you, especially when we look at the way the world works. COVID, like I said, was a great, it was our starter pandemic, and we which we flunked miserably. And not just because of our medical response, but because of our, the way we live. He talks about in the book, um, our just-in-time uh, supply chain, which means we don't stockpile anything. We don't store anything. We don't warehouse anything. We, we just ship it, ship it, ship it. We get it from overseas. Uh, and th as a result of that, you know, we're we're still living the effects of that because of you know we see the inflation and we're like well inflation this inflation that inflation was caused by a supply and demand thing that said when you have a just in time supply chain and everything goes sideways in the places that are supplying you what you need you're not going to get it and when you do get it you're going to pay through the nose to get it mm -hmm. so you know, the the ripple effect of pandemics and what they do worldwide aren't just in the fact that pandemics kill people it's that they disrupt everything else that happens. I mean, you know, if you look at COVID, COVID was not the deadliest pandemic. And, you know, the, the mortality rate of COVID was about 4%, which was, you know, which is still enough to, to be super concerning. But it, look at the ripple effect of the supply chain that happened because of it. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at something like MERS, which is uh, going on in Egypt in 2015, you know, the, the mortality rate of MERS was about 30%, which is crazy. You know, if that had gotten out, that would have, that would have literally drove it, driven us into almost a post-apocalyptic sort of world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to anyway. say, because smallpox is about 40% and, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that 
that was terrifying for people. So if you have something that's like 30%, I mean, the movie Contagion, it was like 35 to 40%. Look what happened in that movie. And and that was civilized compared to the, what we would probably, how we would probably behave. So, yeah. And, you know, you, you look at, you know, 30% brings down governments. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, smallpox brought down civilizations, you know, and that's. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, Yep. So anyway, that's my number one scariest book for so many reasons. And I just think it's a fascinating read because you learn something about epidemiology. And what I learned reading this book is how little I know about any of this. And Mm -hmm. that, you know, these are people that are experts in their field that have been studying not just the viruses themselves, but the, the detective work that it takes. I mean, being an epidemiologist is that not only do you have to be incredibly knowledgeable um, and just, you know, the biological processes, but you have to be such a good detective in eliminating what it couldn't be mm-hmm. and then trying to figure out what it could be beyond that. So that's, yeah, that's, that's my number one scariest book. So sorry. I talked, I talked a lot about that. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Uh, all right. So here's our even more scary books to consider. And why don't you take us through your list first? Man, do I have a long list? Um, Told. madam. Uh, I'm listening to this right now on um, Audible. It's a book I discovered last year. It's a novel uh, by uh, Phoebe Wayne, and it's very gothic. Uh, It takes place in a girls' uh, school, a very exclusive girls' school in uh, Scotland during the 1990s, about the time that um, uh, Diane and uh, the prince are um, divorcing. Uh, It is a very, oh, and the main uh, character is a classist, so she teaches Latin and the classics at a very exclusive girls' school. So it gives you this great um, gothic uh, novel, uh, incorporated with Greek and Roman, um, uh, uh, mythology and history based on women in Greek mythology and history. So it's, it's so awesome. I love this story so much and it'll freak you out. Uh, the next one is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno. And I want Guillermo del Toro to, uh, to make a, a film from this movie. It's set in Mexico during the 1950s. And again, very Gothic. Uh, this woman ends up in this scary ass mansion with these weird ass people. Ooh, it's so good. <laughs> Uh, the only those are the, good best, those in- are the best kind of books. Yeah. Uh, the Only Good Indians, which is by uh, Stephen Graham Jones. And this actually, uh, the main character is a Blackfoot Indian. And uh, the shenanigans that he is some of his friends got into when they were in, uh, when they were teenagers. And now the, um, the spirit that is taking them out one by one. Oh, this book is fucked up. Man, it is it scary fucked up. But Jenny Brothers, I want you to read this because one of the characters is a basketball player. She's a high school basketball player. And the person cool. that wrote this book loves fucking girls of basketball. So it's this, yeah. it's, it's a great story. It's a really great story. Uh, De-Evolution, nice. a firsthand account of the mm. Rainier Sasquatch Massacre by Max about Brooks. That book. Uh, So this is another Max Brooks. He did the World War Z. You will never be able to look at funny um, uh, Bigfoot paraphernalia the same again, nor will you be ever, ever able to think of um, predator prey relationships in the same way again, or how you view nature. Or just when some natural disaster happens and it almost brings down your government. So Mm. again, another thing I like about this, a lot of this book is written as oral history and diary entries. And I love that. So because what it does is that it gives you this really interesting perspective from lots of different people. And also because they're diary entries, you never get... You, you're allowed to fill in so much of your own information because it never gives you a complete picture. There's always mystery there. So I love that. The Handmaiden's Tale by Margaret Ackwood. This was the first book uh, before the uh, Testaments. Sleeping Beauties by Stephen and Owen King. If you are a woman, you will cry, angry cry reading this book. Uh, oh. A Haunting of Hill House. This is a classic by Shirley Jackson. If you want to see um, where... At the time it was written, it was a modern interpretation of what Gothic novels were. And a lot of um, haunting stories that you see now in film and um, TV and books are inspired by The Haunting of Hill House. 
So this, uh, uh, you like it darker. This is the newest set of um, short stories by Stephen King. I just read this because I always like to read short uh, sh a set of scary short stories during uh, um, my my sp spooky time. I actually finished this before <laughs> October because I just couldn't wait. So this is the newest one by Stephen King, Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Uh, I've talked about this actually uh, several times this year already because I think this book is awesome. But if you are into dystopian um, fiction. This one, this will do it for you. The Last House on Needless Street. This is a very, very hard book to read. Uh, it's long. It's a very slow burn, and it will break your heart. It, I will give you this. It has a positive ending. So if you delve into this, it will be hard on you, but know that you will, um, it, it has a positive ending. I, I'm just going to get, because I almost didn't finish it because it's such a hard book to read, but it's a very, very interesting perspective on um, mental illness. Uh, the Wishing Pool and other stories. This was my um, this was my go to last year for my my haunted uh, haunted short stories. Really fun. I, actually, because of this book, I ended up reading Parable of the Sower because one of the stories talks about um, all these stories that you should read instead of Stephen King, and that was one of them. <laughs> so it it took me to other stories. It was that awesome. Uh, Salem's Lot by Stephen King. If you need if you like vampire stories, this one will freak you out. That's a good one. It's the best yeah. one, I think. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, Ghostly. This is a compilation I'm reading by um, Audrey uh, Niffinger. Okay. Uh, she wrote um, the, uh, gosh, um, Time Traveler's Wife. Okay, uh, yeah. She has, most of this is a, compil a compilation of older ghost stories. Uh, and I've been enjoying the older ghost stories. Like the first one is uh, um, Edgar Allan Poe's story, uh, The Black Cat. So um, I, and then she has one of her own stories in it. I was not a big fan of her story, but I am really enjoying the other ghost stories in it. Of course, The Shining by Stephen King. If you want an excellent version of, if you want, if you want Gothic, you got to read Frankenstein by Mary, uh, Mary Shelley. I am amazed and how many people, like in films, they'll like reference Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and actually what they're referencing is the movie. And I just want to like scream and like, you know, flip a table. I'm like, that's not the bot, that's the movie. So <laughs> if triggered. you want to read, yeah, triggered. If you want to <laughs> read an excellent book, um, Frankenstein's, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's really, it's exceptionally, uh, it's exceptionally good and, um, it, it, it will break your heart a little bit. Only Ever Yours. This is another super hard book. And unlike um, The Lad House, Last House on Leadless Street, this does not have a positive ending. Uh, this Ooh. is, this is um, a young adult book. Uh, the author is English. It is fucked up. And I can't get it out of my head, Jenny Brothers. I cannot get it out. I go back to it a couple times a year. And um, it's not, it's a short, it's a short book. So like I said, it's young adult. It's oh, woof, woof. Yeah. Yeesh. Talk about okay. a book that okay. makes you, it makes you wonder your place in it. Ugh. And as yeah. I was reading, the yeah. first time I was reading it, I was like, this has no happy ending. There's no happy, there's nothing that can happen in this book that will allow the main character to have her happy ending. And it doesn't, but it is so relevant and so on point. It's kind of like, you know, some of your, your, um, your nonfiction that you chose, Jenny, it's, it's so mm -hmm. real. And I see it now all the time when I see media directed at young women. And I mm. it brings me back to this book all the time. I'm like, oh, it's only ever yours. This is exactly what they're, this is, this is what happens when we take the media, what we direct at young women and we distill it to its most evil yes. point. We have a comment. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I would recommend it, but just know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> so, uh, Tina, uh, Tina Albright, uh, Tina, I don't know how to pronounce your, your last name. Uh, Trank, Trank, Trankaida, Trank, you'll have to tell me, uh, <laughs> is with us. <laughs> Sorry, Tina. And, uh, she says, Anne's reaction and voice with the table flipping is scary movie scene in itself. Oh girl, you don't even know. So. You don't even know. You don't <laughs> yeah. even know. So, yeah. So, um, Tina, yeah. thank you for being with us. We love you. 
<laughs> so those are my, um, that's my, my highly recommended list. I would recommend every book on this list. Some of them are not easy reads, but that is the point I think of horror is that, um, uh, they, they give us reality. They give us an, a perspective of reality. Um, that is sometimes better than, um, it's more thought provoking than reality itself. It's easy to dismiss reality as you're too busy. These books are difficult to dismiss. Got it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tranquita. Thank you, Tina. Mm -hmm. I won't make that mistake again. I got I it. Probably, I probably won't. <laughs> mm, that's okay. I won't. I'll try not to. Uh, again, so glad you are with us. Uh, well, my list is, uh, for those of you that may not have already realized this, Anne is the more literary of the two of us. Um, <laughs> I like books. Books on my face. Yeah, Anne likes books, and she has always been, I, I read, and reads. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for me, um, Silence of the Lambs, it's a great book. Uh, mm -hmm. The movie gets all the attention, but the book is killer good. Yeah. Uh, is killer Salem's good. Lot. Salem's Lot's cool because... Stephen King draws from other, he, he goes back to this well mm -hmm. a couple of times in, in his mm -hmm. work and his short stories, which I, I love that about his work. Yeah. Um, uh, it by Stephen King, which mm -hmm. I reread it this summer. It hasn't aged well. I it still has like not. it. It is not, mm -hmm. but it is not aged well uh, as far as his books go. Um, World War Z, which is again, such a sweet book. Uh, Stephen King, um, I like a lot of, the, what I love most about Stephen King are his shorts. And he has, mm -hmm. he has so much work that he has done his 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 well of works is ocean is like pacific ocean deep as far mm -hmm. as what he's done through his career he never stops writing he never not writes you know and his short stories are a great introduction if you're not familiar with stephen king if you want to dip a toe highly recommend his anthologies and his books of short stories mm -hmm. uh the story apt pupil um which is to me one of the deepest darkest most horrifying stories ever written mm -hmm. stephen king that's from uh, Different Seasons, which is a short book. Also, it's funny, um, the, uh, Different Seasons is also where uh, Shawshank Redemption comes from. The, yeah. the story Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption came mm -hmm. from that particular book. Uh, and of course, Night Shift by Stephen King, another sh book of short stories. My three favorites out of that, Strawberry Spring, Jerusalem's Lot, and One for the Road. Uh, and again, there's that Salem's Lot. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, agreed, Tina. Jerusalem's Lot scared the crap out of me. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so, it's, it's, it's again, it's gothic and yeah. it's uh, gross. And mm -hmm. in, in, in the way that only, if you've ever been out East, Joe described this when he was working in Maine about 10 years ago, that the East, Eastern United States is haunted as fuck. And that's a mm -hmm. great way to describe it. And that story lends itself to that haunted as fuck thing that's going mm -hmm. on out East. So uh, it's so old for the road. It is. So you have Salem's Lot, which is, of course, about vampires. Jerusalem's Lot, which draws like the history of Salem's Lot. And then mm -hmm. you have One for the Road, which is also a Salem's Lot story. It's another vampire mm -hmm. story um, about a family that gets. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> Don't so go there. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do not drive through there in a blizzard. There you mm -hmm. go. So yeah. those are like I said, my list is, is of course, much shorter. But and I should have put devolution on there because that is such a great. That's the mm -hmm. um, that's the Sasquatch story. And uh yeah, you, you those those uh, beef jerky commercials with the Sasquatch are less mm -hmm. funny when you think of yourself getting ragdolled by that thing, you know. <laughs> well, you know the thing is, Jenny, when you recommended that book to me, I was like, oh, I'm not interested in a Bigfoot movie or Bigfoot book. But the Mac, it was Max Brooks. I was like, I yeah. loved uh, World War Z, and I was like, you know, what? I'm going to give this a try because it's a Max Brooks. And I just, I literally read it in three days. Could not put it, was it down. So good. <laughs> God, it was yeah, so good. Just great. Mm -hmm. just a great book good story yeah. um and again as a it has volcanoes in it too i'm like two things i love you know fiction and volcanoes you know and that's <laughs> yeah. there you go so i'm easy to please mm -hmm. all right uh well here we are coming up on an hour Woo! good Woof. work uh you so guys books. did it you have sp spent nearly an hour with us as we have digested we, you've got work to do uh viewing and listening audience mm -hmm. Find some books. Uh, and I will say that one of the things I love is I do love me some audiobook. And mm -hmm. that is one of the things that has been a game changer for me as far as upping my reading quota is that um, I, I have, I'm always like doing things. So it's nice to be able to plug in and mow my lawn and listen to a book and clean my house mm -hmm. and listen to a book and drive and listen to a book. And that's one of the things I love. So yay, 
Yeah. You don't necessarily have to do Audible. There are public library versions mm -hmm. that you can do for free. So just know that you don't necessarily have to spend money on an Audible membership. Uh, you can, you know, there's many free versions that you can do, especially through your public library. So check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you for spending an hour or so with us learning things about stuff. This week you learned about our spooktacular reading lists. Um, Ann and I did our top five amongst other things. And remember, we want to hear from you. We loved hearing mm -hmm. from Tina today during the show. Um, we you, want Tina. to hear from you. Answer our poll questions. Give us your questions, concerns, comments, and confessions. 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 So many confessions. You heard Jenny and I confessing why we ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. And we uh -huh. have different motivations for that. So <laughs> very different, <laughs> very different. So yes. Uh, remember, you can support the brother sisters for free, like subscribe, follow, leave us a review on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Apple podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon music, put the word out. You guys share with your friends and family that you should listen to these two nerds talk about stuff because exactly. that's what we do now. I'm like, why not us? Why, why not? not us? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? So there you go. Uh, join us next week. Spook, our spook fest, our spooktacular spooktober continues. Uh, this week, Anne is going to talk about her passion project, which is bats. Bats. Not the baseball bats. equipment, the mammals. No. Not the Louisville slugger type. Mm -mm. Nope. She's going to talk about the mammal, the flying mammal, the bat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and because it's October and we continue our month long Halloween celebration by talking about bats. Uh -huh. There you go. There you um, go. I'm going to start up our music and take oh, us yeah. out. Wait, awesome, wait. Jenny Brothers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is. There it is. I'm going to take that out right there. That's right. There we are. Uh, so until next week, you guys, I am Janice Brothers. And with me is and my brothers. sister. And brothers. With her, and brothers. With her little cat thing, whatever that is. That's okay. It's, it's, a, um, it's a day of the dead cat. The day of the dead cat that she got at CBS because for whatever reason, drugstores have the best stuff yeah, you do. Uh, we want you to get out there do something smart do something dumb do something fun we are out of here bye